don't forget that uh, tomorrow, a week from a week from today, is the, uh, the first exam. Uh, if you have questions, uh, by all means get in touch with me. Don't forget the uh, study guide is available on Blackboard. Uh, so be looking over that. If you have questions, uh, you feel free to contact me. Um, as well, two weeks from today is the second reflective essay. So keep that going on your mind as well. Um, most of you had, did not complete the first one, which was fine. Uh, if you did complete the first uh, the first essay, it's been graded and comments returned to you. So if you have questions about the comments, that's fine. Uh, you know, if you have questions about the comments, feel free to get in touch with me uh, about that. But if you have any questions uh, for those of you that, that did not uh, complete the first one as you're preparing for the second one, uh, you know, get in contact with me. If you did complete the first one and there isn't a grade for it, uh, then there was some sort of problem with Blackboard. So get in touch with me as soon as possible uh, about that. Today our focus is predominantly going to be on thinking about Islam, particularly in Western society, both as <coughs> the encounter between Islam and the Western world, as well as uh, Muslims living in Western countries, especially the United States, um, all of which have led to a variety of challenges, both for Muslims and for people living uh, in those countries and for people in the West. It's only been within the past uh, couple of decades that people have started to realize that world history is more than just Western civilization. A lot of the focus in, in previous generations was on just things that were happening in Europe and then Europe and the United States or North America. Um, but progress and development was occurring in a variety of other places as well. Islamic civilization especially flourished through what's called the Middle Ages. And during those times, there were a variety of cultures that interacted, sharing um, literature, arts, approach to politics, that were distinct from what we would call Western civilization or Western Christianity. There are a variety of ways that we might look at what's often called the encounter between the West and Islam, but there are three major places that I would like to highlight. The first major one, of course, would be the Crusades. Now, certainly there were armed conflicts between Muslims and uh, Christians in a variety of other times, but the sustained nature of the violence and um, warfare uh, through the Crusades marks even the encounter between uh, Muslims and Westerners even today. You know, in the centuries after the birth of Islam, as we noted, there were times of relative peace between the, the growing Islamic power and the Christian power that existed. But, a lot of that changed in the 11th century, um, particularly as these kind of uh, conflicts over Jerusalem, the Middle East, came into war. There are usually three myths that are promoted regarding the Crusades, usually from a Western perspective. First is that it was Muslims that started all of this, uh, which is in incorrect. It was not, Muslims were not the provocateurs in the Crusades. The second uh, myth that floats around was that Christianity triumphed. Well, Christian soldiers at times were successful at regaining control of different places, but overall, um, the Christian powers that went into the Middle East largely failed uh, in their missions to liberate it from Muslim control. And then thirdly, that uh, Christian fighters that went over there were fighting for liberation. Well, you know, that's kind of the overarching narrative, right? This is the thing that is motivating. A lot of people were going not to, not from this kind of grandiose, uh, well-intentioned, let's liberate these countries from Muslim control kind of motive, but instead were going out for, uh, they were going out for uh, gold, right? They were being paid to go to the Middle East. Uh, they were going for their own glory. They were going for religious benefits. The, Pope, uh, the popes at various times promised that those that went on this uh, military pilgrimage, as they referred to it, 
would receive benefits in the afterlife. They would have some uh, consideration in the afterlife. And so they weren't going there out of this noble goal of, of liberating these lands all the time. Sometimes it was very personal individualistic goals. Jerusalem had been under Arab control since the year 638, so just shortly after the death of Muhammad. And for five centuries, Christians, Jews, and Muslims had lived in relative peace in that area. In the year 1071, uh, the emperor of the eastern part of Europe, what's known as the Byzantine Empire, called for Christian rulers and for the Pope to come help, and help him prevent Muslims from taking control of what was then called Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And so he believed that by encouraging this military pilgrimage, right, this is the language that's used, to Jerusalem was the answer, that Muslims would then focus on the Middle East and stop, uh, you know, causing uh, trouble at the eastern border. By retaking Jerusalem and its surrounding areas, uh, he believed that this would be the way to get Muslims off his doorstep. The Pope at the time, Pope Urban II, called the First Crusade to free the Holy Land. It was the first of several different crusades. Ultimately, for the Pope, it was an opportunity for him to gain not just religious power, but political and secular power as well. Christians, uh, Christian soldiers, or soldiers that identified as Christians, uh, ransacked the Middle East for its wealth. Unfortunately, there were atrocities on both sides of this warfare, and the Crusades have deeply affected Muslim and Christian relations since that time. Uh, they ended in the 15th century, when the city of Constantinople fell to Muslim control. Another facet of Muslim-Christian relations, um, Muslim-Western relations, was the colonialism of European powers. By the 19th century, a lot of Muslim societies had been on the decline. I mean, we have the Ottoman Empire that is uh, declining throughout the 19th century, and then other places as well under Muslim control. European powers overpowered North Africa, places in the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia. The French would take over uh, at places in Africa and what was known as the Levant, which is uh, Lebanon and Syria, which is why the modern day group ISIS is often referred to as ISIL, Islamic State in the Levant, uh, and it's the Lebanon and Syria modern day country. Uh, the British took control of Palestine, Iraq, the Arabian Gulf, and India. And the British and the Dutch both had presences in Southeast Asia. With the European armies that came, also came missionaries. And their message was to try and convert Muslims. From the standpoint of Muslims encountering these colonial imperial powers, there were a variety of ways that they responded. Some attempted to resist, right? use a warfare, use military tactics to get European powers out of their countries. Others would flee, especially elite classes, would flee to places not under European control. Some other elites, and especially the rulers, thought that they would maintain their power by adopting things from Western culture, and so often engaged in this kind of compromising relationships with these British, French, or Dutch forces, um, believing that if they adopted some aspects of Western culture, the knowledge, the science, the technology, um, that they might have the means to control their regions, perhaps even to get rid of these European powers. But many of these Muslim leaders that interacted with Western colonial powers often tended to drift towards secularizing. And so they kind of made attempts to restrict religious leaders, others that would call for uh, warfare, kind of compromising or cooperating with uh, the Europeans. The last aspect I want to mention as far as this kind of historical overview is something that we've already talked about as well. And this too has a lot of impact on what we're seeing today. After World War II, um, the European powers that had won 
carved up what remained of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottomans had sided with the Germany and Austria, of course, the, the loss in World War I led French and Britain especially to carve it up, eventually creating much of uh, the modern state there in the Middle East, uh, some of which you, know, you see Egypt in 1922, Saudi Arabia in 1932, Turkey in 1923, some of those later, especially the ones in Africa. Um, but one of the things that happened with this carving out by these European powers is they didn't pay attention to some aspects of the differences between Muslims, uh, or they weren't really concerned about that. So, for example, in, in carving out Iraq, in that region were Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds who tended to be Christian. And so when, when the United States went in uh, in the war with Iraq in 2003 and deposed uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, brought democracy, um, there was this kind of moment of, why are these people not fighting against each other? Well, because there's been such an oppression of the Shia by the Sunni, uh, and so and they were just kind of lumped together uh, instead of trying to respect some of those differences. And so a lot of the governments that were put in place in these places were either, you know, colonial powers, right? There was a representative from uh, Britain or France, or uh, it was people who took the time to seize power and then kind of cooperated with the colonial powers again. And so a lot of people in these countries questioned the legitimacy of their power. Who is this person? That, you know, this, this is a person who has uh, kind of gotten or, or has left Islam, has turned away from Islam because they're siding with these European powers which were understood by Muslims to be Christian. Many of these powers, many of the people that kind of cooperated with the Europeans, tended to then oppress their peoples, and so they ended up being dictators. So you can, I think, understand, although we don't certainly support the antagonism towards the West, you can kind of understand why there would be this antagonism to the West by Muslims, because you're the ones that put these people in power. They oppressed us. They were dictators. Um, and so, you know, this, this hatred to the West that's kind of been building for several centuries is not without its sense, uh, it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't make sense. Now, certainly, it should not condone bombings, other terrorist activities, but as far as understanding why, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with those aspects. And in the context of this upheaval, Right. Losing power, finding yourself subservient to Europeans, there were a variety of attempts by Muslims to engage in these moments of reform. Right. As they see their countries or their leaders becoming more secular, there were religious leaders that were attempting to try to call the people of these places back to Islam. Uh, there was a prophetic tradition that said God will send to this community at the head of each century those who will renew its faith for it. So even in the early years, there was this expectation that uh, people are going to become lax in their spirituality. There's going to need to be individuals who will call people back to Islam, to the Sunnah of the Quran. One of the elements, uh, and out of this, of course, come several different reform movements. We're not going to talk about all of them. We'll just talk about two, uh, two that are particularly important for a lot of contemporary issues. But one important aspect of reform is this idea of jihad. Now, jihad, of course, in the West has been tied up with uh, this idea of uh, you know, militaristic struggle. There's certainly that aspect of it. But jihad itself, the term, simply can be understood as struggle or striving. And essentially, there are two types of jihad in Islam. The first is what's called the greater jihad, the attempt to, the struggle to, the attempt to make oneself right with God. And so the idea of submitting to what God dictates in the Quran, the example of the Prophet and the Sunnah, is a struggle. The lesser jihad is the, or the outer jihad, is the struggle to make one's society more Islamic. And so on the one hand, the inner jihad is about this personal 
change. The other is trying to change your society. Now, this outer jihad, this outer struggle, is expressed also in two ways. There is the jihad of the pen, which is an attempt to persuade people to become more Islam. Right? And so you're, you're writing things or you're speaking and trying to convince people right, to go back to the Quran, go back to Sharia. It is the jihad of the sword that gets the most attention because it is the violent one. I mean, it is the one that uses the power, the might, to try and turn a society back to, um, to Sharia, to the Quran. Now, it's the jihad of the sword that has been the focus of radical Muslims or Islamists and the one that we hear the most about. But even in the idea of jihad of the sword, there are conditions in, in Sharia about how it is to be performed. And a lot of those conditions are ignored by the radical Muslims, the Islamists, the terrorists, whatever name we want to use. Because there are things like the use of proportional violence. Right? So if somebody throws a rock at you, you do not throw a nuclear bomb at them. Uh, you respond in proportion. Uh, things like uh, you do not target uh, will, women, children, innocents, non-combatants. Right? You know, you, you, your target is military forces. And then something else is that jihad can only be declared, the jihad of the sword can only be declared by a head of state. Right? So you have to be in a political power to declare uh, jihad of the sword. And so most of what we see today that is called jihad in those cases is not jihad according to Sharia. That doesn't mean, of course, that we should ignore the fact that there are those people out there doing those kind of things. But it's, you know, even, even Muslims who would support outer jihad are, would say, right, that's not... Uh, that's not appropriate. So a lot of Muslims uh, would condemn Osama bin Laden, right, because he called for a jihad. Um, and they would say, well, you're not head of state, right, so you don't have the right to, to call this. Um, and so jihad itself means struggle. The greater jihad is the personal one, but the outer jihad, uh, even there, is not in its essence violent. And so jihad itself does not translate. People say well, jihad means holy war. It does not. Is there one aspect of it that is a holy war? Absolutely. Okay. So that's definitely one aspect of that. But it's not the entirety of what jihad means for Muslims. We talk about two renewal movements. Uh, the first uh, one is Wahhabism. The followers of Wahhabism, especially in the early form, called themselves Unitarians, with the idea of emphasizing the unity of God. But the Wahhabis are named after their founder, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who lived in the 18th century. He joined forces with a local prince, Muhammad al Saud, to attempt to create a renewal movement in the Arabian Peninsula. The focus of the Wahhabi movement tended to be uh, militant in those early years because it was trying to unite the Arabian Peninsula. Abdul Wahhab had felt that the Arabian Peninsula and the people that, that were in power had kind of moved away from Islam and had developed and gone back to some pre-Islamic practices and ideas. And so he's trying to renew this. There was also the spread of Sufism that he was very opposed to, and even to some extent some Shia religious sites and practices. So this is predominantly, we're talking about a movement against other Muslims. He wanted to purify the Islam uh, of the time, thinking that a lot of things that were un-Islamic had gotten into practice there. Muslims that disagreed with uh, Abu Wahhab uh, were declared enemies of God and faced all sorts of persecution uh, struggles until essentially the group did succeed in uniting much of the Arabian Peninsula and so a lot of Muslims in Saudi Arabia today are Wahhabis or are from the Wahhabi tradition. Uh, 
Another reform movement, also having some prominence today, was the development of the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood. A more recent development, this one in the 19, uh, 1900s, and focused in Egypt, developed by a man named Hassan al The focus of uh, the Brotherhood in the early years was secular, secular elites in Egypt. And the, the, the country, of course, had kind of gotten too secular, largely too, due to uh, European influence, and had kind of divided up, in a sense, between politics and religion. And so there was the kind of the politics, and then there was the Islam. Well, Obama and then the people that started to follow him argued that Islam itself was all that was necessary to provide you know, the way to engage modern life. And so Islam covered not just religious things, but political, uh, social, economic institutions. In many ways, Albana especially, in the early years, tried to do this in kind of more of a gradual, persuasive type of approach. This was not something, unlike the Wahhabi movement, where there was an attempt to militarily. But in the 50s and 60s, there were a variety of things that changed, making the Muslim Brotherhood more radicalized. And so the Muslim Brotherhood today is a radical uh, militant group in many respects, especially as things happened in 2011 with the, with the Arab Spring. Uh, there was a lot of concern about well, if the Muslim Brotherhood gains power in Egypt, what's that going to mean for the relationship between Egypt and other countries? 